Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. Today, my topic is related to the Apple Wi-Fi subsystem. The title is Dive into Apple I.O. 802.11, Family version 2. My name is Wang Yu from DD Research America. I can be reached through this email address. In the first part of the presentation, we will focus on the architecture of the subsystem. IO802.11 family is a very old kernel component, but things has changed since last year. Apple refactored the architecture of the Wi-Fi client drivers and uh, renamed the new generation design to version 2. So our questions follow. Why does Apple need to refactor the code? What are the new changes? And what is the impact of these changes? For us, we may pay more attention to security impact. I will try to answer these questions. I hope this presentation will help you better understand the architecture and the security challenges of the Apple Wi-Fi subsystem. If we call the previous generation as version one, we will see that version one and version two as family drivers play a very important role in Apple's communication model. They are responsible for managing almost all Wi-Fi communication functions. Here are some specific examples. Uh, for example, we need to set up and manager SSID channel antenna rate, something like that. With this basic concept in mind, let's examine the subsystem from a higher perspective. The above management features are common to the two generations of design, but soon we will find some differences. Here I list some typical modules of version one era from user mode to kernel mode. For daemon, we have AirPod. After entering the kernel, we have the version one uh, family kernel extensions and plugin drivers. In short, version one is mainly designed to support Apple AirPod and the related equipment. We can also find this from the name of plugin drivers, uh, like, uh, like uh, AirPod Broadcom. However, with the development of mobile devices, we can see that the, the design concepts of the Wi-Fi wi subsystem has changed. IO802.11 family version 2 is mainly designed for communication and the data sharing between the new generation mobile-based Apple devices and AirPod no longer appears in the name of the kernel extensions. It's all removed. Here are two examples. We can see that the new subsystem is better supported, such as Skywalk. Reverse engineering shows that many functions integrate at least the three branches, which lead to different subsystem. And the Skywalk, is the one that was recently introduced. For new features, Sidecar was recently introduced as well. Two conclusions here. Number one, Family version two is a brand new design for the mobile era. Number two, Family version two and WLAN core integrate the original AirPod Broadcom drivers with more features and better logic. One more thing is that, please also keep in mind, new features always mean new attack surfaces. If we want to further understand the Wi-Fi subsystem, where should we start? My approach is that I follow the two articles by Jonathan. These two articles try to build an Wi-Fi compatible framework 
from scratch. Through this project, we can quickly become familiar with the user mode of the entire Wi-Fi subsystem and the interface of the kernel layer. Personally, I have learned a lot from the compatible framework project. Seeing this, you might say that I'm familiar with this matter uh, because we did many similar projects on Windows platform. For example, in order to combat rootkits and kernel inline hook, we have tried such solutions in file system and the network related functions. Yes, you're right. Uh, but before we start, I would recommend it reading uh, the following projects like Intel Wi-Fi for Mac OS and uh, Udo Wi-Fi. In the next section, uh, we will focus on attack surface and uh, security assessment. First of all, we should consider all inputs are potentially dangerous, or we can call it zero trust. For kernel, the attack surface can be divided into at least two categories, um, from remote and local firmware to operating system kernel, and from daemon and uh, framework to operating system kernel. The third category belongs to some exceptions. So I listed uh, it as all, all other handlers and the puzzles. For the category from remote and firmware to kernel, I have two examples. The first one is from the research of Google Project Zero. Gail Biniamni discovered a large number of vulnerabilities caused by handle event packet. This function can be reached remotely. The second example is handle firmware trap. This function handles requests and events from the firmware. They are all excellent attack surfaces. For the other direction, from user mode to kernel. As early as 2007, magazine Uninformed had an article about the set scan request vulnerability, which is well worth reading. In addition, we also have examples for Airport Broadcom NIC. The two links below are from ZDI. For the third category, it covers a wide range. For example, AWDL protocol, uh, Skywalk, and the routing uh, handle data packet. These are the attack surfaces that I discovered during daily debugging. Behind them are often very complex designs. Two years ago, I wrote a kernel extension called Kimon. In addition to monitoring features, Kimon has an inline hook engine, which can hook almost any function, kernel function you want. The source code can be found on GitHub. And last year, I practiced the Mac OS, IPC, and XPC communication monitoring based on this project. Here is a link to Black Hat Arsenal 2019. And in order to learn more about the attack surfaces of the Wi-Fi subsystem, I wrote several sniffers based on Kmon. So that's why I introduced the Kmon to you. Uh, this picture is one of them. It can intercept all get and set requests sent to the Wi-Fi family drivers. But because Kmon has pre and post callback capabilities. I can pass the input parameters and other useful information in the pre callback handler. As we can see, uh, I can capture process name, type, uh, user buffer, and the length, user buffer length. I can also modify return data 
of the target function in the post callback handler. Like the uh, compatible framework project, these sniffers happen to me a lot. So let's make a, a summary. Since I have came on in hand, I can perform code coverage analysis on the closed source drivers. I implement several sniffers, so I can convert them to passive fuzzer. And for example, I can do bit flipping of input parameters easily. I have compatible frameworks, so I can also uh, convert them to active fuzzers. In practice, I found that combining the two fuzzing methods often has better results. Okay. Uh, in the next section, we will discuss the latest vulnerability cases that I found this year. So far, um, I have reported a total of 18 vulnerabilities of the Wi-Fi subsystem to Apple security. And four of them were repelled at the end of May. Uh, the types of vulnerabilities covered uh, HIP overflow, um, HIP data OOB access, kernel information disclosure, um, stack overflow without cookie protection, arbitrary kernel memory write, and, uh, and the integral overflow. Um, it can be said that I have been dealing with all kind of stranger panics in the past few months. I can classify this vulnerability from another perspective. Uh, like number one, vulnerabilities affecting OLIN version two, and the vulnerabilities affecting both version one and version two. And the number three, vulnerabilities affecting OLIN version one. Further, uh, if we Deeply analysis the first category, vulnerabilities affecting OLIN family version two, we can find that it can be disassembled as uh, 1.1, uh, introduced into V2 when porting existing V1 features, and 1.2, uh, introduced into V2 when implementing new features. Uh, we will discuss them one by one. But let's start with CVE 2020-9834. It belongs to category 1.1. Generally speaking, uh, when I run Fuzzer for the first time, usually nothing happens. I, I need to spend a lot of effort to find out what is the reason for not having panics. Maybe the target is really robust or maybe the code coverage rate of my father is too low. But this time, this time was different. I got a panic report at the same time I rang the father. And after an hour, there were too many reports to handle. Um, I have four cases here. Um, so to, to save time, uh, let me skip the, the case one uh, case two, because they are uh, all non-point dereference issue. And case three, the last panic log seems pretty good. Its call stack is clear, and the instruction that caused uh, the crash seems uh, full of hope. Uh, seems we can control the REX register. But then I started to tailor my fuzzer. I narrowed down the scope step by step until I found the routing set scan request. Um, in the output of the ADA hex ray on the right, we can see that on lines uh, 34 and 35, the input from user mode should not be uh, greater than 9D4. This is a very large input structure. To understand the root cause of the problem, we need to figure out the, the detail 
of the structure. So one challenge I faced at the time was whether uh, this input structure could be clarified through uh, like remote, remote engineering. So I found a method. Reverse engineering is feasible. Um, I found debugging information in routing set scan request uh, here. In which a lot of readable strings were submitted to the function cc log string. For example, uh, on the right side, we can see that uh, the offset 34 of the input structure should be uh, a member called scan type, and the 44 uh, should be a, a member called number of channels. So, so we can have a table. We can make a table. Um, as the program continue to execute, we will continue, we will come to a routing uh, called fill scan parameters. This function is responsible for uh, extracting external parameters and uh, feeding the input into an internal structure. The data structure on the left is passed in by callers, and we can treat it as um, untrusted or tainted data. The data structure on the right is the internal data structure of field scan parameter, which is merged uh, external inputs. I audited um, each member's copying process one by one until I saw the code on the right. I, I found a, a fatal error. On the first of the line of the picture, uh, which is 179 of the ADA hex three code, here, the program extracts uh, data from the 44 offset of the input buffer. Combining the previous knowledge, we know that the private symbol of this uh, member is number of channels. Then the value of number of channels will be stored at the offset 3C, okay, 3C of the internal structure. The key point is the do well loop uh, that starts at uh, 185. The loop starts at zero and uh, accumulates until it equals number of channels here. So is there an upper limit for number of channels? Unfortunately, I, I don't see such logic in the code. In other world, uh, the external input number of channels determines the number of execution of the do well loop, which can be zero or can be Hundred thousand, but you know, hundred thousand is absolutely unacceptable. It's hippo floor. And by the way, uh, there is an interesting fact is in the, in, in this code, on uh, line one eight eight, we can see that when the code reads data from the input buffer, it will skip c bytes each time. This detail is actually very important. Um, when writing exploit code, we need to set the memory layout according to this feature. After having all this analysis, we finally got a sense of this heap overflow vulnerability. In the input buffer on the left, if we lay out a memory like this, uh, we will have full write capability to the target internal structure. And because number of channels can be fully manipulated, so we can precisely control the number of bytes overflowed. Okay, uh, let me uh, summarize the root cause of CVE 2020-9834. The vulnerable function lacks the necessary checks for number of channels in the input, parameter, in, input structure, which leads to out-of-bound operations. 
Uh, Autobahn's operation has two place, places, source and uh, destination buffer. For source buffer, this means autobound access. And for destination buffer, this means uh, heap override. The quality of this vulnerability is pretty good because the write primitive is relatively complete. And for uh, vulnerability is incomplete write primitive, uh, please refer to my previous write-up. So at this point, we can uh, write the analysis report and even exploit code. But there are still some unanswered questions, uh, such as why does the write primitive read from the, the inputs every C bytes? And what is the remaining meaning of the remaining fields in the input structure? Uh, usually, if I, I have a new task coming, I will leave a to-do list here. And maybe I will not touch it for years. But uh, this year is really special. Working at home is boring to me, so I found this the Apple SDK. From macOS X 10.1 to macOS 10.15. It is interesting that the SDK header files of the Wi-Fi subsystem appeared briefly on the 10.4, 5, and 6. Since uh, 10.7, these files have been removed. Uh, so we have a very small window to pick at what the sixth file contains. And next, I found that, I found that there are some uh, projects that did contain more recent Apple uh, Wi-Fi SDK header files, like uh, Hi Sierra or even Katrina. So uh, why? Is Apple's SDK code leaked? Mm, not really. After comparison, I found that the code was not from Apple. They are more like the community's uh, reverse knowledge sharing. In order to write compatible frameworks and better support net network devices, they reversed a large number of kernel drivers. Uh, for example, the interfaces here are all from reverse engineering of family kernel extensions. Well, um, maybe I can also contribute to the community. This is the 18 interface added by macOS Big Sur. These interfaces represent the latest changes in the platform. So together, we can make the community a better place. Without further ado, let's go back to the vulnerability. With the support of the Apple SDK, we can get all the necessary information, including unknown fields. The previous question was uh, can also answered. The reason for reading every C bytes is because there is a substruct array in the definition of scan data. And the vulnerable routing only wants to copy the channel member, channel members. In addition, uh, we can see that here. Here is the definition called max channels, which is uh, 64 insights. So the, the vulnerable code does not follow the requirements here. I think you may have a similar questions as I did a few months ago. Why, why can such an obvious vulnerability survive to 2020? The, the answer is that this vulnerability was introduced into V2 when porting the existing feature of V1. And uh, there is no problem with V1 related function. We can see in the picture on the right, um, there is a limit on the size of the array on macOS Mojave. But for unknown reasons, IO80211 family version 2 removed the binary check. Uh, so this is a brand new vulnerability introduced by developers. 
A more, a more interesting fact is that this is not the first time that the set scan request function is vulnerable. If you have uh, read the, the article uh, OSX uh, kernel mode exploitation in a weekend uh, before, you will find this function was attacked 13 years ago. So if other had a time machine at that time, I would suggest flying to 2020. This year is so special. Uh, he will be surprised. Okay, the next case is also interesting. It, it belongs to the category 1.2. Um, I have three pictures here. The first picture uh, mainly says um, the driver allocates over 200 bytes to a buffer called the trapping four. But please note that there's no initialization uh, at this stage. In the second picture on the right, we finally see the initialization process of this buffer. A routing named uh, a handle firmware trap will fill in the trap in four with information written by the firmware. The third picture uh, actually sends this information to the caller. Uh, in short, we have three functions and the three steps, allocation, initialization, and uh, extraction. So my question is, can you spot the hidden vulnerability among them? Yeah, I know, uh, boring question. Let, let me speed up. I, I only have 40 minutes. Um, this codes uh, make an assumption. The expected execution order is step one, two, and then three. So my question can actually be changed to, is it possible to extract the information before it is initialized? The answer is yes. It is possible. The leaked heap data can exit 200 bytes, including kernel data, function pointers, and we can see a large number of kernel objects leaked on the right. Um, we, we need to beat uh, KASLR when writing exploit code. Uh, I also tried it. In the figure, uh, we can see that the destination is the buffer to be returned to the user mode. And the source is a trapping for buffer. And at here, the base address of the trapping for buffer has been leaked through heap entry. You can see here, this address, uh, this data is actually the, the the base address of uh, trapping for buffer. So, and then uh, KASR will be will become meaningless. Okay, um, I have a demo of this vulnerability. Please let me uh, play the video. Okay. Um, the operating system is unpatched. It's a it's an old version, and uh, let me run the exploit. Yeah, we can see a large number of kernel functions function pointers leaked. They are all kernel objects. Okay, um, the following two vulnerabilities belongs, belong to the second category. Um, let me make the, the, the long story short. I found this problem uh, both uh, on old and new family drivers. The root cause is still related to uh, input validation. These are the panic logs of the two versions. 
we can say when I passing, uh, for example, data beef, uh, the function set scanning state will read uh, out of bounds. This vulnerability can be used to uh, detect uh, uh, heap data or memory layout, but uh, uh, I, I have to say its quality cannot be compared with the previous one. Okay, um, the third category is vulnerability affecting only one. Uh, in other words, um, version two fixes uh, vulnerable functions. Uh, unfortunately, these important improvements have not been synchronized with other system platforms. So we can use them to attack targets like the latest macOS Mojave and the macOS High Sierra. Um, Apple plans to address this case in a future uh, security update. Um, in addition to the above vulnerabilities, I, I have at least a dozen new zero days waiting to be fixed. Uh, but uh, I cannot share the, their details this time. Uh, maybe in the future, I will share this interesting and powerful vulnerability with you through blog. Um, let's work together to protect the endpoint security of Apple platforms. Thanks. Um, I mentioned uh, I implemented uh, several Wi-Fi fuzzers. So let's say how it works on macOS Big Sur. Please let me play the video. Okay. Yes, this video. Um, this is a target machine. Um, and the OS is the latest Mac OS Big Sur. Uh, we can say the, the build number is uh, 4300B, is the latest one. Um, and uh, let me run my father. Yes. Okay, um, after a few seconds, the system crashed. Um, this is the, this is the um, target machine. And on the left set is the LLDB remote debugger. You can see uh, the current instruction shows that uh, this is a panic. Okay. Okay, yeah. Another interesting uh, question is, does uh, do this vulnerabilities uh, affect uh, iOS? Um, the answer is yes, again. Um, we just uh, need to add an entitlement to the POC, um, like uh, com.apple.wlan authentication, dot authentication. And then for CVE 2020, 9834, we can get such a panic uh, on iOS. The version number is uh, iPhone OS 13, um, build number is 17050. Um, it's a hip override vulnerability. Okay, let's move to the last uh, section of today's presentation. Takeaways. Uh, the first point is related to the architecture of the Wi-Fi subsystem. Family version two and the WLAN core integrates the original AirPod Broadcom drivers with more features 
and more reasonable logic. The second I want to say is new features always mean new attack surfaces. And number three, um, the Apple SDK helped me a lot. Uh, for me, combining reverse engineering and the Apple SDK means a better life. The last one, we reviewed several brand new uh, kernel vulnerabilities. And in the future, we will have some more interesting cases. Um, time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Um, uh, yes, we have one question. It's about my uh, fuzzing method. Um, OK, yeah. Uh, my fuzzing method con consists of three parts. Um, the first one is I wrote uh, my own uh, IO uh, Apple 80211 compatible framework uh, according to the method of uh, Jonathan. This project can be uh, trans transformed into an active fuzzard. And I implement a uh, uh, Wi-Fi request sniffer based on Kmon. Um, so this project can either be transformed to a passive budget. For example, uh, I can do bit flipping um, for the whole subsystem. And um, I also implement a, a simple code coverage analysis tool based on Kmon's inline hook engine. So um, right now, the, the current version is still very basic. Uh, the current version works at the, the function level and uh, supports about hundreds of uh, IO control handlers and uh, abnormal um, exit branches. Um, but this, this version already helped me uh, find uh, kernel vulnerabilities. So um, yes, uh, I, I combined uh, um, two different ways together. And uh, I have a, a, a simple <laughs> code coverage uh, analysis solution. Um, yeah, that's my uh, fuzzing method. Another thing I want to mention is that uh, um, in this slide, I, uh, I have three CVEs. Um, CVE 2020-9832 is related to kernel extension, um, IO Wi-Fi family version 2. And uh, uh, the CVE number 9833 is related to the underlying uh, plugin drivers, um, the Apple VCM, WM, bus interface PCIe. And the, the CVE number 9834 is related to the function of uh, Apple VCM, WN, uh, WLAN core. So uh, in other words, the entire kernel core stack of uh, IO uh, Wi-Fi version 2 has been found to have problems. So, uh, so, so uh, to me, I think uh, there's still room for uh, improvement. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> that, that's it. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, and uh, thanks for watching.